Thank you, Lord. Be with my mouth this morning. Teach me what I should say, Lord. I'm led by your spirit. I thank you, Father, for your people. I thank you for their hearts, that they're open and receptive to your word, the living word. Amen. Thank you. Amen. All right. God is so good. He's just, I don't know. I, I'm so excited for this study. I, I had so many places and so many things that I could talk about just from this study, but, you know, we don't have that kind of time, right? But that's okay. So if you can turn to me, turn to me, turn in your Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. And Second Chronicles is going to be in the Old Testament. So glad you ladies are able to make it this morning. God loves you, amen? Okay, so Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. Let's see what the word says. It says here, Ooh, am I in the right place? Hang on. Second Chronicles. Oh, no, I'm not in the right place. Sorry. Hallelujah. Okay. Chapter 16, verse 9. God's word says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal. Wow. So, I have another translation that says, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose heart are fully committed to him. Isn't that awesome? That, that's so awesome. That means that God is looking around, and he's, he's just like us parents, right? Don't we look at our kids and we just want to give them everything we just want to bless them we just want to be there for them we want them to be number one them to you know have the best and we want to give it to them but sometimes they're not deserving of it right sometimes it's like you know I want to let you go but your grades are just like I mean three F's isn't cutting it I'm sorry you're grounded but my friends, sorry, you know, bring those grades up. You know what I mean? God is looking at us down here on the earth, and he's searching. He wants to strengthen us. He knows that we're going to come across problems. He knows our problems. He knows our trials and tribulations. He wants us to strengthen us. He wants to, to get us through it. He wants to help us. That's what he wants to do. But how many of you know there's people walking around that have all these problems, but they don't want to go to church. But they don't want to turn to God. But they don't want to put him first place. They call themselves a Christian, but they're over here, you know, doing God knows what. You know what I mean? God can't help those people if they don't want the help. We, we want the help. That's why we're here this morning. Amen? We're like, we're hungry. We're like, God, we're fully committed. We're going to be here. It's a Saturday. I know you guys could be in other places right now. You guys could be getting a lot of things done right now. I know. Us women, we do a lot. Amen? I mean, thank God that this is a break for us. But it's a good break. Amen? So God is seeing your heart right now. He sees that you are fully committed. Amen? And for those who are listening, who really, really can't be here, not because they're not fully committed, but another engagement, you know, was already on the calendar. Let's face it, this is not our normal women's meeting day, right? We meet the first Saturday of every month, so I can understand for those who didn't have it on their calendar. But normally, you know, there's, they're going to listen in, right? So um, we know who's committed. God knows who's committed. It doesn't even matter what do we see. Right? Because just because somebody's not here doesn't mean they're fully, not fully committed, right? But, um, but yeah, there's a million places you guys could be. There's a million things you could be doing. But you're here because you are fully committed. So God's saying he wants to strengthen you. He wants to help you out in your situation. Amen? All right. So um, a lot of the times we who are fully committed, 
are trying to find our purpose and trying to find, God, well, what do you want me to do? You know, we're fully committed. We're like, what next? I'm here. Let's go. What are we going to do? Right? So it's like we're asking, you know, who am I in Christ and why am I here, Lord? Okay. Let's go over to Revelations chapter 4. And so we've got Revelations, the last book of the Bible. We're going to look at chapter 4. And we're going to look at verse 11. Okay. It says here, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. All things. He created all things. And it says here, by his, and by your will, they exist and were created. Let's talk about that for just a minute. There's a, a, a Greek word called thelema. Okay? It means the result of of the will okay the result of the will not to be conceived as a demand but as an expression or inclination of pleasure towards that which is liked that which pleases and creates joy okay so that's what the lima means the result of the will. So let's go back to the scripture where it says in verse 11, the second part, it says, For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So what is that saying? That's saying that he created us simply because he wanted to. It's an, it's an expression of his pleasure towards that which is light that which pleases and creates joy. I'll give you an example. How many of you have said this to someone? Don't do that because I want you to. Do it because you want to. Right? We've all said that to somebody, right? Whether it be our spouses, our kids, or whatever. You know, don't do it because I'm telling you to. You know, how, how many of you say, you know, uh, okay, yes, I love flowers and chocolate. Um, I wish my, since my husband knows that, I hope he brings that to me, like, whenever he wants to express his love, you know. So it's Valentine's Day. You're like, where's the flowers and the chocolate? Oh, I forgot. Let me run out and get it. No, no, it's too late now. I don't want it now. You know, if I have to tell you to do it, it means nothing, right? This is the same thing. God didn't create us. He created us because he simply wanted to. He simply took pleasure in creating us. You know what I mean? He created us because he just wanted to love us, you know, and like us, you know. He's not doing it to have robots. He's not doing it because he could have made robots and just had them, have them worship and do whatever he tells. But that's not, no. He wants fellowship. He wants relationship. So he did it simply out of his pure joy and pleasure he created, right? That is so good. Okay, so with that being said, I want to take you to another scripture. Let's go to Isaiah. Now we're going to the Old Testament. Isaiah, and we're going to go to chapter 43. So I told you why God created us, simply because he wanted to simply because he loves us, simply because it was for his pure pleasure and joy. Okay, so Isaiah 43. Now I'm going to take you to chapter, I mean, we're in chapter 43, verse 7. It says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I made him. Okay. More confirmation, more description of why God made us, right? For his glory. Okay, have you ever wondered? Because I used to wonder for a long time. You know, we used to, in our old church, we used to have a guy 
kind of like Al, where he'd shout out some, you know, amens and hallelujahs and praise God and, and things like this. And he was so encouraging. But what was so cool about him is he had a really deep voice, and he would go, glory, you know, and real loud, you know, and especially during praise and worship, and we're all singing. Oh, it was so beautiful to sit near him because he'd be singing with this really deep, deep voice, you know. Um, who is that, Earl, jo Earl James Jones or... James Earl Jones has that real deep voice. It was kind of like that. And he would be back there and he'd go, glory, you know, really deep and loud. And it was so, so um, powerful, you know. And I used to think, that's so cool, you know. Obviously, I can't do that. I'm trying to imitate him. And I'm not going deep enough or loud enough or strong enough. But he did, you know. And I, Elias and I, we always admired that about him, you know. And, and, um, and then, of course, later you know, as time had gone on, we'd always hear people, you know, glory be to God, glory, glory, glory. And that's just not a word that you and I use every day. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm not at work and I go, glory, you know, the, pray, the copy machine's working, you know, glory. I don't do that. You know what I mean? I don't talk like that. You know what I'm saying? So I always, for all these years, used to wonder, like, I know what glory means, you know, um, but I just couldn't like bring myself to always be saying it. And, and even, you know, after a while, when I was really getting into praise and worship, I said, I, I would look up the word and then I go, okay, yes, to God be the glory. Glory, you know, yes, he's glory, you know. And then I could use it a little bit more. But I thought it was really cool. And this here, when it says here um, that, you know, we were created for his glory, right? Um, I thought... It was cool because, uh, hang on a second. Okay, yeah, because I lost my place. <laughs> um, I got In this study, I got to look at glory a little bit deeper, and I thought, oh, okay, now that even makes more sense. So, of course, I'm sharing it with you guys. Glory, um, in, in the Greek, the word is kavod, K-A-V-O-D-H, okay, kavod. And it means weight, honor esteem, majesty, abundance, and wealth. And I thought, okay, yeah, I mean, esteem, yeah, that's why when we're praising him, we say glory, because we're esteeming God, you know, we're lifting him up, right? And uh, majesty, hey, he's royalty, he's the king of kings, amen? And so I go, I get it, honor, yes, I'm honoring him, glory be to God, you know? So when I look at the scripture and it says here that we were created for his glory, we were created because for his honor. I mean, he, he honored us. He, he, we carry that much, you know, we're that important to him, right? But here's the word that, that threw me a little bit, and the very first word that it said was weight, you know? And I thought, well, okay, that's a little odd, the word weight, but let's think about it. Let's think about that word, and let's think about what it means. Okay, when we measure or we weigh things, a lot of things are weighed, and, they, and the more that they weigh, they become more valuable, right? So in ancient times, everything was weighed. I mean, you're doing something, you weigh it, and then the more heavier it is, the more valuable it is, right? Gold, right? Certain foods, you know, the more that it weighs, the more that it costs, right? So think about that. We were, we are his children. We are his riches. We are his treasure, okay? And we are the apple of his eye. We are just that important to him. We were made for his glory, right? And I was like, okay, I got you, Lord. And, and definitely he's that in our life, right? He's, he's immeasurable, invaluable to me. You know what I mean? And, and so the more of him, glory be to God, glory. Now I understand that word a little bit better, and now I can use it better right? More often. I'm not ashamed to use that word. So I thought, all right, all right. So thank you, Lord, for creating us for his glory. So that's how important and valuable that we are to him. Amen? Okay, let's go over to Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. We all know this scripture. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. God is so good. We love you, Lord. We are so valuable to him, guys. <clears throat> okay. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus is speaking. Okay. And, it, and you've heard this, this scripture before. It says, 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay. How does Jesus know this? Why is he saying this to the people? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Remember I said earlier, we are God's treasure. Okay. We are his heart. Have you ever heard somebody say, they're my heart? You know what I mean? That means they are so valuable to me. And God is, God is, Jesus is speaking, and he's telling them, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And he knows this because he knows about treasure and value. And that's us. We are his heart. Okay? So what I'm trying to get you to, to see this morning is that God made you not because he had to, but because he wanted to. And God loves you so much, you're so valuable to him. Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you that your life is, does, doesn't mean anything and that what you do here doesn't mean anything. Don't let him lie to you. You're all fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen? God loves you so much, you guys. You are invaluable to him. Okay? Now, let me, let me take you, let's see, <laughs> okay, when God created man and woman, he put them where? In the Garden of Eden, remember? How many of you buy something or see something in the store and you think, oh, that is so beautiful, I know exactly where I'm going to put it? And you take it home all excited, and you're like clearing out, you know, the place that you're going to put it, and you, and you place it there, and you're like, yes, that looks so beautiful right there. Sometimes if any of you are collectors, sometimes you have collect, a collection of something, and you place it there, and most of the time we're collecting something for what reason? Either just because we, it brings us pleasure. Somehow, some way, some shape, it brings us pleasure. Whether it's just pleasing to the eye, it just looks beautiful. Remember those little crystal, crystal things? I don't know what they call them, but people used to collect those, and they probably still do, where they have like a whole curio, and you see all these little crystal. They're beautiful. They sparkle, you know? Um, I personally collect Barbies, but not because of, uh, like, just to have every Barbie. No. There's a method to my madness. <laughs> Every Barbie that I have reflects some part of my life, okay? I have the Barbie that, that's dressed in the McDonald's uniform. I have that Barbie because that was my first job, McDonald's, you know? Um, I have a Barbie. My mom bought it for me. Um, she's, it's a birthday Barbie. And my mom says, she looks just like you when you were 10. Your hair was the same way with the little bangs and the brown hair. And she says, I bought it for you because... It reminds me of you when you were 10. And I said, oh, okay, you know, so that's in my collection. So I have Barbies, um, and believe it or not, way back when, I actually seen a Barbie, a preacher Barbie holding a Bible. I'm going to be looking for that Barbie now. <laughs> um, back when I seen it was years ago, and I wasn't a preacher. <laughs> so um, another thing, too, is just, I mean, you, you collect things, and you know exactly where you're going to put them. You know, you know exactly what you're going to do with them. And sometimes you're, like, thinking about it, and you're like, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to place it in that spot in the yard, but before I do that, I've got to clear it out. You know, what about when you bring home a new plant? You're going to put it in your garden. You've got to do some weeding. You've got to do some digging. You've got to clear it out and put it in just the perfect spot so it looks beautiful right where it is. Because you treasure these things, right? And, and the bottom line is God took man and woman and put them in the Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden was perfect. It was beautiful. It was a splendor place. There was no problems in the Garden of Eden. I mean, they didn't have any uh, sickness. There was no sickness. There was no floods. There was no, no demands on them whatsoever. There was no stress. There was no drought. There was no bills. There was no hunger. There was no kids. Oh, I'm just saying. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There was nothing in the garden to hinder them. You know what I'm saying? It was perfect. So God put them in the 
perfect place. He knew just what he was going to do with them. He knew just how he wanted them to live. Then he wanted him to live forever, right? I mean, he, he just had it. He just put them in the right place, right? No irre irreconcilable differences, right? I mean, everything was perfect. Adam and Eve were the perfect couple. So what happened? Why did they sin? Okay. Why did they sin? Well, we're going to get to that. Okay. How often do we say to ourselves, you know, I would love to be at church every Sunday. I would love to be there every time the doors are open. I would, I would love to serve God with all my heart. I would put him first place, first priority. Um, you know, I would love to, to do that. That's my heart. That's what I want to do. However, what keeps us from doing that? Well, Sometimes it's our job, sometimes it's our schedule, sometimes it's the kids, sometimes it's our spouse, sometimes it's, right? We, we all have some reason where we can't put God first place like we want him to be, right? So sometimes he's not first place, and there's reasons for it. Maybe we have a sick child. Maybe we're sick, you know, we can't get there. But we would have loved to be there. Our, our intentions are right. Amen? Okay. Well, Adam and Eve, they did not sin because of their circumstances. And I'm not saying that we're sinning, but anything that keeps you from God is considered sin. That's what the Bible says. So I know some people who are involved in certain things that they can't be here on Sunday, and they're never going to be able to be here on Sunday. I remember um, when I used to work, every Saturday, and I couldn't make it. This was my first year of going to church, and I couldn't make it to any of the women's breakfasts that they used to have at our old church. I just, I wanted to go. They would invite me every time, and I wanted to be there, but I had to work every Saturday. It was just, it was my job. I mean, I would have loved to have been there. I needed to be there as a new believer. I needed to be at church as often as possible and getting as much as I could, um, but because of my job, I couldn't be there. So I prayed. You know, I prayed about it. And, you know, God hears our prayers, amen? And what happened finally, the first meeting I ever went to, whoo-wee, God did a work. You know what I'm saying? He did a work in me. Because you figure, it's my first year of walking with the Lord. I had a lot of questions, you know, and I had a lot of, of, um, of issues still in my life that, that needed help, you know. And so there I went, finally was able to get to my first meeting, and, and God helped me out a lot, you know. So I would have loved to have been going from day one, but I couldn't because of the job, you know. So sometimes we're far away from God because of our circumstances, you know. Some of us, you know, like I said, we might have a sick child. We might have sick kids. How many of you get the flu and it goes through the whole house? And before you know it, you know, me, we as mom, right, um, we're tending to everybody first because they're sick, then and we end up getting sick, right? So it's like, you know, sometimes you, you can't do everything that you want to do. So definitely we want to. Um, but Adam and Eve, they had no reason, no reason to sin whatsoever. But it, isn't because of their, it wasn't because of their circumstances. It was basically a product of our heart. Sometimes we don't get to where God wants us to be because we have some heart issues, you know? Sometimes, when I was saying earlier about those people that have problems, but they won't seek God, they have heart issues. They are having some problems internally, you know what I'm saying? And, um, and even us Christians can get some problems in our heart, which is why we're always, when we pray, we always say, I, we're always praying for your heart. That, there, that these seeds, these words, that God's words are being planted on good ground. That's your heart. We're praying for your heart. We pray that you have an open heart to the things of God. So we're praying for you guys because how many of you know, even though we're believers and we're Christians, sometimes things come up. And I'm always checking myself. You know what I mean? I'm always like, when I'm, not ha when I'm, not, when I'm starting to not feel good about something, I have to stop and check myself and say, why am I not feel good feeling good about that? What's going on, Lord? You know, am I, am I in unforgiveness right now? Am I um, feeling feelings of hate right now? Am I feeling feelings of jealousy right now? Like, what is going on with my heart? 
See, and I'm a believer, and I've been a believer for 20 years, but I still have to check myself. You know what I'm saying? So Adam and Eve were in the perfect will of God. They were in the perfect place, but they ended up having an issue of the heart, amen? And, and that's what happened. That's why they sinned. It was a heart issue. Okay, let's go to... Um, because let's go to Jeremiah 17.9. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Don't go there. I'm jumping ahead. Maybe I'm not. Hang on. All right. There's a question I'm going to pose to you. What is the human heart like apart from fellowship with God? Okay? Think about that question. Remember on Wednesday, Pastor said the same question when we were talking about, remember he led us to Galatians to talk about the fruit of the Spirit? That was pretty much why we were there, because we were talking about, you know, how you could see what's going on by your fruit, right? And, And then, remember, I read a little further up, and I said, this is what's going on, and... Um, the works of the flesh are these, and then we read all these things, remember that? Same thing. Just like I was saying a little bit ago, I have to check myself. You know, I have to say, what's going on with my heart? What's going on inside of me? See, when I said earlier that this study led me to want to go in a lot of different directions, I so wanted to go study more about the flesh and more about our mind and more about our spirit and more about our heart and how I could tie all of this together and show you some things regarding what's going on inside of us or what could potentially go on inside of us. But, of course, like I said, I don't have that kind of time, right? But I thought if um, just to... to um, before, so we can take a break, um, let's go to Galatians real quick, like we did on Wednesday, just so we can kind of go over these things quickly. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's start at 22. When we were talking about this on Wednesday, we read this. But the fruit of the Spirit, right, because the Spirit is what is inside of us, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I know for long-suffering, the word there also is patience, okay? So we went over this on Wednesday, and you know... Pastor has always said it, and I always say it. The fruit of the Spirit is my thing. I'm always looking to the fruit of the Spirit because this is the goal right here. This is what I want to be coming out of me. This is what I want others to see in my life. See, that's the thing. You know you're in a good place when people can see your fruit, and it's good. You know what I'm saying? Because there's bad fruit. How many of you know when you look at trees, you could see some really good fruit. You're like, mm, mm, I want that one right there. And then you see the other ones that are rotting, fell to the ground. You're like, ew, I don't want that. <laughs> right? Same thing, the fruit of the Spirit. I'm always looking that, Lord, help me walk in love and help me be in joy. Because joy is not the same as happiness. Happiness is an emotion that can change in an instant. But joy is something that's just in you no matter what. Joy is the thing that sustains you in the midst of a storm. Sure, peace does, but joy does. You know what I mean? Joy is that thing that when you stub your toe, you're like, (laughs) oh, man, oh, man, let me walk this off. Mm -hmm. Ah, Okay, yeah, yeah. And see, I got a smile on my face. You see that? Yeah, this is joy, you know, in in the midst of something that just happened. You know, no matter what, I'm going to have joy right? Um, Let's see, what else? And of course, there's peace. And then long-suffering. Long-suffering is a good one because, like I said, patience, ooh, ooh, that's a tough one. You know, I often, often tell people, our old pastor, he used to say, you know, people don't know, but, you know, I shop in regular stores too, 
And sometimes I'll be at the grocery store and I see a member of the church and I see them being impatient, being rude to the clerk, you know, being mean to their kids, being angry and upset. Why do we get this way? Why do us moms get upset with our kids? <laughs> there was this lady, I was at the store yesterday, and she's pushing her little boy around in the cart, and he's crying, and he's going, I want to go with Grandma. And he's just crying and crying, and she's just walking, pushing around, pushing. I mean, she, yeah, she had like a smile on her face, the peace, and she's just like, la, la. Anyways, and then she goes, yes, yes, I hear you, mm-hmm, but what do we got to do? Yes, we've got, uh-huh, la, la, I mean, she's like, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, just thinking, okay, and this is bad enough, but I'm thinking, would you just leave already? No, <laughs> would you just take him? I mean, really, I mean, I understand what she's doing, but, oh, I'm getting a headache. No, you know what I'm saying? But this is just in my head, and I'm going, you know what? I'm going back and forth in my head because I'm like, I know. I'm a mom. I do it. I've done it. I've, you know, hey, I understand. But see, I'm a different mom. Every mom is different, but I would. I'll just, number one, wouldn't have the kid with me. <laughs> That's just me. I always tell my daughter, why do you even take them? I wouldn't, if I could leave them, I, I would. But I know some people can't leave them. There's nobody to leave them with. I understand. Then there's the um, tactic of, you know, warn them, and if they start acting up, leave right where you are and just tell them, well, then we're leaving, and you're not getting whatever, and we leave, you know, and some people do that. But this lady, she was so patient, and she's just walking around, mm -hmm. I'm not kidding you, the kid cried for probably uh, over 30 minutes. It must have been close to an hour. You could hear him all over the store, all over. And then some women were telling her, oh, I know what you're going through. It's okay, you know, so it's like a lot of us that were there were women, so we all were pretty patient, you know what I'm saying, because we were all have kids, but I'm just saying that this is something that some women I've seen be really rude when kids are like that, or give dirty looks, or, you know, do this, do that, whatever, or tell them, you know, what you should, really should do is take him in the bathroom and do this and that, you know, everybody has their opinions, you know what I'm saying? But everybody's different. So, you, you know, you're just because you do something and it worked for you doesn't mean it's going to work for them. So a lot of us did pretty good yesterday. Nobody really said anything, and we were all pretty patient. And some of us were even a step beyond loving and encouraging to that mom. And I thought that was really neat when I was hearing some of the women tell her. I thought that's pretty cool. But patience, that's a tough one, okay? Um, and then it goes on, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Ooh, how about that one? Just being gentle, just being gentle. Sometimes we're a little hard, you know. Sometimes we could be harsh, even, even without knowing it, you know. And then there's the self-control. Hmm. Good old self-control, you know what I mean? A lot of us want to say and think that we are in control. We're in control. We're a little bit too controlling, you know what I'm saying? But there's certain things that, you know, sometimes I think, how would I say this? You need to keep yourself under control about your controlling issues. No. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Some, some, some of us can be so controlling, we need to kick back. You know what I'm saying? We need to check ourselves. We need to be like, am I too much right now? You know what I'm saying? And, and just, you know, have God help you with that. Okay, so there was all of those good things that, that we strive to do and be. And all of that really comes from the heart. In order to be this, it comes from the heart. And, and that's why you've got to get the word in you to change that heart, okay? And then we, when, um, on Wednesday, I went up and I, I said, it says in verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Okay, and this is basically, remember I, I asked the question, what does a, an unsanctified heart look like? Well, this is an unsanctified heart. This is a person who's not saved. This is someone who's, whose heart is far from God, okay? Verse 19, it says this, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, 
selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, murders, drunkenness, revelries, are the like of which I tell you. All of these things are an unsanctified heart. That means someone who's not walking with God, someone whose heart has not changed, someone who has not invited Jesus into their heart. But yet, aren't you looking at all of these and saying, sometimes some of these things come upon me. Sometimes I deal with some of these issues. I mean, let's face it, outbursts of wrath. You know, I was talking about the mom with the kid yesterday. How many of you have been in a store and the mom's going, you know what, you better shut your mouth or I'm going to beat you blue, black and blue and oh no, you did it. How many of you have heard a woman going off like that on a little kid? I have. Outbursts of wrath. How many of you have had an argument with your spouse and you weren't very gentle and you weren't very kind? All your words weren't kind. Okay, you weren't joyful in that argument. You know what I'm saying? You guys are all looking at me like you've never done that. Okay, I'm a, I'm, I've been there, okay? How about idolatry? You know, how about jealousy? How about envy? How about self-ambitions? You know, people are always trying to look out for number one, you know, the kids, the kids tease me because a long time ago, <laughs> a long time ago, we were at our old house, <clears throat> and me and the kids, well, it was Ronnie and a few of her friends, we were in the front yard, and a car started coming from up the street, turned off its lights, and started driving by. And we saw it, and we said, oh, man, who's that? Uh-oh, it's a drive-by. And so we all start booking it to the house. We're running, right? And we get to the door. And I, mind you, I don't know how old Ronnie and her teenage friends were, but they were teenagers, okay? And they were pretty fast, okay? So we all, because they run track and they do sports and whatever. So we all run to the door. And, and I think they were the first ones to the door. And here I come running up from the back. And I'm like grabbing them from the shoulders and the shirt. And I'm moving them out of the way. And I'm opening the door like this. And, and we all run in, you know, but, um, but the girls were laughing afterwards. They think, guy mom, you know, you're just over here like throwing us out of the way, not even letting us get in whatever happened to children first or whatever, you know. And I just started laughing because it's true. I did do that, you know. And, and so we always joke about that. Remember that time mom's over here throwing us out of the way, you know. And I like to say that I was just trying to make sure the door opened so they can get in safely. <laughs> I went in first, yes, but, but I had to to let them in safely, see, no, <laughs> but anyways, I'm just saying, sometimes we have selfish ambitions, you know what I mean, sometimes we get selfish, you know, sometimes it's all about us, right, and, and that's what I'm saying, these things come upon us, but they're all matters of the heart, okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and break so we can have a snack, and we're going to come back to this, okay, God has some really good stuff he's going to show us in the second session.